we can joke all we want or I can make funny jokes on Instagram, but at the end of the day, if my ice cream sucks, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So I tell everyone, no, if it's ice cream, if it's photography, just double, triple down on it. Be so good at what you do and focus on that one thing that people can't deny it. Steve Martin has a quote. We have a, a quote of it on our truck. It says, be so good they can't ignore you. And I, I tell people that all the time, no matter if your podcast, anything, just focus, go all in on that one thing and focus on that. And people will, I mean, I know it sounds cheesy. If you build it, they will come. Maybe they won't come. But <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I genuinely believe if you focus on that thing, the social media and the press will follow. This is Startup to Storefront, the podcast where we inspire entrepreneurship through truth. Today's guest is Joe Nietzsche, founder of CVT SoftServe. Like a lot of East Coasters who move out West, Joe found himself in Los Angeles searching for comfort food to remind him of where he came from. The problem was that Joe's comfort food was soft serve ice cream and LA really didn't offer that particular food group. Sure, there were ice cream parlors and frozen yogurt shops, but none of those really hit the spot for Joe. So he did what any self-enterprising person would do. He created his own soft serve company. Well, first he had to find an old Mr. Softy ice cream truck, fix it up, ship it to LA, get all the permits, yada, yada, yada. But we'll cover all of that later in the episode. Joe's story is a perfect example of how a great product paired with an electric personality can catapult a company to uncharted heights. So listen in as we cover everything from why the customer is not always right, the trials and errors of finding the best spots to park your ice cream truck, and why there should be ice cream served in every gym. Hang on, hang on. If you're not subscribed, can you go ahead and do that right now before we get on with the video? Helps us out tremendously. That's all we ask. And we're back. All right, welcome to the podcast, everyone. On today's show, we have Joe from CVT Soft Serve. Joe, thanks for coming on. For everybody listening, tell us a little bit about what you do. I am the owner and operator of CVT Soft Serve. We are a soft serve business here in Los Angeles. We opened about seven years ago almost. Can't believe that. And um, yeah, I won't toot my own horn too much. But we won Best Food Truck LA by Eater LA, LA Magazine. We've got a lot of great press and I think great ice cream. Yeah, and just for people listening to you guys have some pretty unbelievable trucks. I don't know how you describe them. For me, they're kind of like this vintage Ghostbuster meets UPS truck that just happens to serve some pretty delicious soft serve, which it's like a 90s thing, I feel like. I feel like people, like kids of today, don't get soft serve anymore, but I don't know if I'm totally off point. You're not off point. No, the trucks themselves are from the 1960s. They were uh, Mr. Softy trucks from New York. They were originally soft serve trucks. Uh, one's a 1960, the other one's a 61. But soft serve in general in LA was not a big thing. I moved out here to LA in the late 90s and people who are from LA, I'd ask, you know, where do you get soft serve ice cream? And they didn't even know what that was. They thought it was frozen yogurt. I was like, this mm. is crazy. There's no good soft serve <laughs> in LA. So I, I jokingly say we opened out of frustration, but we legitimately opened out of frustration for not having the good products. That's such an interesting dichotomy there. So Diego and I are also from the East Coast. Why is soft serve a coastal thing? Like why why is there an East Coast, West Coast, like one has, one has nothing? You know, how did that originate? Do you know the history? I, I don't know though. I don't know the origin of it, but I can tell you that LA has frozen yogurt central. And if you want to say LA is health conscious with the amount of green juice places in town, you could go there, but I feel like when it came to LA, it was like, ooh, we want ice cream, but let's go really healthy. And the irony of it is if you go to like Pink Berry or any of these places, you watch people get yogurt and then they just dump gummy bears and Oreos <laughs> and all sorts of crap all over it. Like that's not healthy. So, guilty, guilty, you know, baby. Uh, yeah, uh, just uh, lure lure me in with the health, con. like even the just the facade, like call it yeah. vegan glory which is a restaurant here. And I'll just yeah, get all the fried stuff. I'll just eat everything sure. fried, but hey, sure. it's plants or so yeah. they tell me. I wanted to have you on for so many reasons. One, for people listening, please go check out their Instagram. Your Instagram's unbelievable. You have you follow one person, uh, His Holiness, <laughs> Michael Tyson of all people. <laughs> Mike Tyson oh. is an avid fan of your soft serve. How the hell did that relationship develop? 
I don't know. Um, I met a lot of really strange, interesting <laughs> characters here in LA. And early on, because I didn't know the, I guess the proper word would be etiquette of Instagram and social media in general. And I would have people like, hey, will you follow me back? And I was like, what? I literally just use this to post where we're going to be and post funny stuff. I'm not following anyone. So I'm like, I guess I'll just follow Mike Tyson. So I did it. And then it became this like conversation piece where people are like, why do you only follow Mike Tyson? I'm like, it's the greatest boxer of all time. Why not? Why not? <laughs> so, yeah. But he's gone to visit you. He looks like he's visited you a few times. Oddly enough, no joke, tonight my employee told me that the producer for his podcast, Hot Boxing, they stopped by the truck tonight. So, yeah, I mean, I told him, I said, let me know, I'll cater. So I might be driving down to the podcast in a couple of weeks to cater for Tyson. That would be pretty cool. That is pretty cool. Every time I watch yeah. his podcast, I'm like, this guy's on the verge of murdering the person he's talking to and, <laughs> and also having a deep thought at the yep. same time. And I don't yep. know, like, I'm just like, man, he's a tiger inside. Like, you can tell he's ready. Yeah. He could I think that's the beauty. You're, yeah, you're just terrified. You're on edge. Yeah, like the, I, I want to, I want to meet him one day and just say, "Hey, you know, you had a couple of easy fights, and then just run away." Like, <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. Joe, I want to circle back real quick before yeah. we get on yeah. to your trucks. You know, we're we are no stranger to having vehicles with personality on this show. We've had the Mishimobile for I Love Micheladas. We've had Sunny for Farm Cup Coffee, and yep. with you, you have Charlie and Frankie. Correct. And so it's impressive that you were able to source one Mr. Softy truck, but two, I mean, I, I don't even know how many are in existence in America today, but yep. it just seems so incredible that, that you were able to find two of them. Like, what was that search like for you and, and how difficult and how long it, uh, it was? The first one took years. I knew exactly what I wanted. I wanted a vintage Mr. Softy truck and to find it was just like, I was on Craigslist for every city it was like you can't there's no maybe there is now but at the time there wasn't a craigslist craigslist database for every city so i would click on texas and then austin san antonio i go to california san francisco and i just searched like crazy and it finally popped up and i bought it sight unseen off the internet which is a stupid move that's that's literally a whole separate podcast but <laughs> so i bought the truck had it restored and then i was working the streets and every time i got a private event we had to cancel and all my regulars were like what the hell when do i get to, how do i i mean how do we get your stuff it was like Clearly, there's a demand for the product. We need a second truck. So we started searching again on Craigslist. And no joke, it was like out of a movie, barn doors open, and this guy had four of them. So I said, I'll buy them all. And he's like, what? What do you want to do with four? I'm like, I'll buy all of them. They don't run. I'm like, it's fine. I'll take them. <laughs> so now I've stockpiled them because I, I was telling Diego, I would love to have a standalone truck that doesn't move, just like a permanently parked truck, kind of like what's going on with Farm Cup Coffee with Sunny. Wow. But yeah, it was That's it was just wild. sheer luck to find the other. They're basically shells. Did you the find them in L.A. or did you have to ship no. them over? No, upstate okay. New York was the second. Okay. Yep. So they're up there, except for one of them we shipped out. And that's Frankie. And I literally shipped the box out. I was just obsessed with that aesthetic. I wanted that classic look, but everything had to be gutted mechanically to I mean, everything had to be redone. I can yeah. imagine after who knows how long they hadn't been in operation and oh, yeah. you know vehicles that are made from that day aren't sure. exactly in the best shape nowadays even if they were running so no. I can imagine like that was a hefty task for that restoration yeah and especially with the first one I hadn't sold a single ice cream cone in LA first of all also <laughs> there was no soft serve so I'm going to dice on, I'm going to spend all, all this money on this cool looking truck and then bring this product that doesn't exist here because I think it's good. It was it, looking back now. It's nuts. Absolutely. You were probably the coolest dad though. Like cool dad points for sure. Right. At a minimum, you're rich in cool dad points. I would imagine. I explain that to my kids. I say, you guys, you know, this isn't like normal. Like <laughs> you, we have ice cream trucks. Like that's, we went today. To go, he's like, no, we'll go. To, like, we go to the truck. I'm like, sure. I'm like, this is not a normal thing. Like, your friends, <laughs> yeah. So it, that's they're awesome. aware that it's, that it's a treat. When you retrofitted the truck, I know Farm Cup had this issue where basically, like, these cars are somewhat you like super unique, and so there's a limited number of mechanics. One, and then two. At least in Farm Cup's case, when they retrofitted it, the weight was just too much, and so they had this issue of constant breakdowns, and then going to this mechanic who there is only one of in LA. And so what is, is that, I mean, obviously with a coffee, I, I would imagine with that vehicle, they're 
maybe it's a little different than your vehicle. Your vehicle looks a little bit bulky, but what have been the challenges on that side of it? Oh, so I guess for Farm Cup, that's a French truck that they have. So there's yeah. a re really hard thing to find. Mine are Ford engines in them. So anyone that works on classic cars can work on them. That's okay. not the issue. But the jet, the weight of them alone, they're solid steel from the 60s. They're not fiberglass. They're heavy 10,000 pound trucks. They're slow going. Some of the limitations to the business, we don't go on the freeways. They max out about 40 miles an hour. So mm. if I'm in the valley and I'm doing a, a catering for a TV show in Santa Monica, I'm taking the Sepulveda Pass over. It takes us a while to get around, but it's worth it. I think, I mean, I just didn't want a modern truck because I think it would just look like everyone else's and didn't really have that eye-catching appeal. Yeah, no, I love it. And tell everybody, I know you do a lot more than just soft serve. So you have some drinks that you guys make and some. Yeah, yeah. yeah so tell everyone a little about the menu. We have a menu as big as the Cheesecake Factory. It's humongous. <laughs> we have three flavors, chocolate or vanilla or twist, which is technically two flavors. We have just a couple toppings, sprinkles and sea salt. And then we do some drinks. We do a coffee cream, which is an iced coffee. Which we use Stumptown coffee and ice cream instead of ice. And then we do Mexican Coke floats. And then we do orange crush floats too. So yeah, it's- uh, I love it. What is your favorite? Do you have a favorite item? Come on. <laughs> no, it's too hard. I do like the sea salt. I, I twist okay. the sea salt. Yeah. I've never had that. That's interesting. I've never even heard it's of it. It's really that. good. It's really yeah. good. What are like the dumbest questions you've got when people approach a truck? Are they like, oh, is it vegan? Or is it, was it, what kind, what's the nut milk? Like, what, what do you get in LA? Cause it's such a just a position. I've had, I was catering a Porsche dealership in Woodland Hills and I had a woman ask me, is the salt salty? And to this day, <laughs> that is like my top question that was like, are you kidding me? No, I would say once a week, my employee and I, we get frustrated because if you look at a menu and it says chocolate, vanilla, and twist as the three choices, we still get every <laughs> single week, what's a twist? And I was like, could you sort of figure it out based on what else is on the menu? Contextual um, clues. Yeah, exactly. So do you just make lot. stuff up? You're like, you know what? It's whatever yep. you want it to be today. There's just a random yep. factory back there. And when you hit the twist button, you don't know what's yep. going to come out. But I think yep. it's going to be good for you. Yeah. We had a one person come by and say, can I get some strawberry? And I said, oh, we don't have strawberry. And she goes, <laughs> oh, no, I, I was here last week and I had it. And, I, and she goes, it was the other guy. And I was the only employee at the time. I'm like, no, that didn't happen. Yeah. So, oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. Just working with the public in general. And that's kind of or I tailor my uh, social media, my Instagram sort of towards that a little bit. Just kind of like the customer is always right. It's just like the craziest thing to me because it's not true. And I, I do it in a playful way, I think. It can be a little aggressive at times, but I think it's kind of fun. It's funny how when people ask me, like I was telling people I was talking to you and they're like, how, you know, what do they, what do you say, right? So how do you describe Joe? And I was like, he's got this great, he's just the wit and the banter, but pushes just enough and he'll wear it. Like he's got a t-shirt that says, stop standing up when the plane lands. And it's just, yeah. it's just so good. Like, it's like, oh, thank you, you know, your personality is so, what I love in general with business and entrepreneurship is when it's very clear that the person's personality, right? The human is putting their expression of self into their product. Sure. And there's sure. a real honesty to that. And that connects like that is, and it's immediate, like people know right away. And so when I oh. see like you on your Instagram doing that and you're wearing your hilarious stuff and I just. I'm like, this is great. Like it's cause it's oh, honest, you. you know, it's, it's honest. And I think it's important that people do that. Thank you. Yeah. I think authenticity is key to any small business, not just food. And, but yeah, I think people are, they're attracted to that and it's kind of a breath of fresh air. If I would say 99% of ice cream business probably take beautifully lit photos of the ice cream. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. I'd rather just like post funny stories about moron customers. <laughs> I think that's funny. <laughs> so and that's what I do. Not to, not to, you know, to go back on something that happened to all of us. So COVID hits, you have this amazing COVID, not COVID, but you have this amazing business and I imagine everything gets shut down. And like, what has this been like for you and, and your business during this time? Yeah, it was tough. I mean, ice cream, we can still sell. We were technically mobile, so we never actually had to shut down completely, okay. but you know, people being scared, the biggest hit that we took as a business was catering. The bulk of our business was TV, film, catering, weddings big events. I mean, we were doing them two or three a week. It was, you know, that was our, and the, the street truck was basically like a business for the weekends. But when that stopped, we had to go back to both trucks on the streets full time. And then we started doing merch. We sell lots of um, shirts and stuff like that. So we made it work. So I read an article that during the worst of times, like during the great depression, the most successful businesses that it didn't affect at all the economy and the economy went to shit. 
what do you think the best, the most likely business, most likely business to succeed is? Alcohol. I would have said alcohol for sure. That's what I would have thought. And alcohol came in at number two and ice cream came in at number three. And number one was gentlemen's clubs. And I was like, wait, Whoa. what? So no matter what, when people were starving and during the Great Depression, they still reached into their pocket to go to a strip club, to buy alcohol and to eat ice cream. To feel so, good. <laughs> I jokingly put this on my in Instagram. I said, someone should start a strip club ice cream parlor and call it Lickety Splits and we could make a fortune. We would literally just dominate those three things. So someone should take that. Anyone? Wow. <laughs> you mentioned you wanted a permanent location for one of your other trucks. <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> I mean, what, and what could be more perfect? <laughs> exactly. How did we get on that subject? <laughs> I don't know. But COVID. That's, I love that. <laughs> COVID and recession. Oh, yeah. So, yes. Yeah. Basically, ice cream has still, I mean, a lot of comfort food in general has survived. I know people that own pizzerias that are doing better numbers during COVID than they did before. So, yeah. I mean, comfort food is king right now. And pizza, ice cream, alcohol. Did you have to make any odd like modifications to the truck? Because I know like we had to, or at least with Farm Cup, as we're retrofitting it, everything is at least the health department is big on making sure there's plexiglass everywhere. And like the ADA now has a microphone. And I think the, the, you know, the microphone or at least the speaking thing is a, is a newer thing that I'm even seeing just some takeout businesses do. So basically they're not yelling like someone's, they're not like, Joe, your order's ready. Instead of yelling it, they just have the little microphone thing, which is a new thing. It's brand new. It's kind of odd, but. Yeah. The plexi thing was weird to me. They, you have a very small window, especially with pass through for dairy for whatever reason. <laughs> It, yeah. It's really, I mean, I'm like, what this? it's nuts. I have four sinks on my truck. I do no prep whatsoever. We literally are pouring ice cream mix into a soft serve machine. But, but I had to have four sinks. We had to knock out the back wall. It was just a total, it was crazy. It took almost a two years to get the health department to approve everything. And then the second truck was like nothing because we already had the plans. But yeah, it's just, there's a lot of red, red tape. Even, and that, when I first went to the health department with the truck, they're like, well, why don't you just get a new truck? Like this is crazy. Like not, this thing has to be redone. <laughs> that that you guys stands are to reason. It so difficult. The the people yeah. who would work for the health department are the same people with the lack of vision to see why you would want a truck yes. from the 1960s. As yes. as your dear, dear health department, we love you, health department. You're <laughs> yeah. our best love, friends. We can't do anything without you. I just want to make sure the health department yeah. understands okay, let's how much there. we care. Yeah. We, we covered our bases. <laughs> we, okay. We do. You know, I will say on the Farm Cup project, they were very quick. They were like three weeks turnaround. That was it. It was pretty unbelievable yeah. during COVID, That's which I crazy. thought was just literally crazy. I mean, so that, that is we, crazy. Got, we got lucky. But a yeah. bunch of weird stuff came out, like the intercom thing and like uh, ADA access has changed a little bit too, where before you could kind of get away with, you know, eh, kind of ADA-ish. And now it's like they want the same experience. And so they're taking it to a level of, uh, I know you and I talked about this in Austin Austin, Texas, it was like a, a big thing where all these food trucks come together and you have this big event and it's pretty amazing. And uh, the 80, the yeah. problem was for the most part, these trucks don't have ADA access and most of the serving counters or ordering counters at like 40, 42 inches high, which is like 10 inches high than what's ramp. required. Yeah. And they don't have a ramp. And even if they do have a ramp, they just end up building like these two plywood you know, it looks like a little kid's like BMX of <laughs> like ramp that doesn't really work. And so they're starting to crack down on it. But yeah, we had to make a few oddball modifications, but other than that, it was good. And then obviously when you take out the generator, which weighs like a, t a tremendous amount, the truck went up, you know? So it like lifts yep. like four yep. inches. And so that was interesting too. The generator's like 800 pounds. Ours is, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Nuts. We have a huge generator. Because it's also, it's, it's crazy. Joe, I want to go back. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned a little bit ago that it took two years to get the health department to approve your plans. So you mentioned that before you bought the first truck, uh, Charlie, you hadn't even sold a single ice cream cone. And so then from that point, it still took two years before you were able to sell anything. Is that what I'm hearing? That's correct. Wow. And that was because I didn't have, I bought the truck in Texas off Craigslist. And then I thought to myself, which was the worst move ever. Why don't I have it retrofitted in Texas to save money? It's already there. So mm. I got the plans and sent them to the builder. The builder messed it up, had it shipped to LA. They looked it all over. I had to have it rebuilt a second time in LA. You're making me sweat just thinking about this story. It was, it was uh, not a fun time. But yeah, just they wanted to see the truck. They, were like, they couldn't even compare it to another truck because they haven't seen a truck like it before. It was a huge challenge. 
and there were all these things. I was like, well, I don't even know what that means. Like coved walls. What, 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 do you, what is that? So <laughs> <laughs> it was weird. So take us back to that moment of when you were finally able to sell ice cream. I, I can imagine a, a mix of emotions, one of which being, thank God we're finally able to, to operate. But like, you know, how, how long until you felt that you were, had your footing and established? That's a great question. Um, a while, because I was ter I had this feeling of, oh my God, I put all my money and time and effort into this thing and now I can do it. Now what? Day one, where do I go? I don't know. I don't, I've never sold ice cream in LA before. I have ideas. So my first day in business, I went to Pink's Hot Dogs. I was like, that's where I'm going to go. I'm going to park outside Pink's. People love hot dogs and they don't have dessert there. This is going to be great. And I shit you not, every single person walked out of Pink's Hot Dogs holding their stomach saying, oh, that looks great. I'm just so full. I'm so full. I was like, well, this was stupid. But luckily on day one, Courtney Cox comes to the truck, has an ice cream and tweets about it. And it, we had a line in Westwood that night because of that tweet. So I'm like, oh, well, celebrity endorsements are huge. I guess I should play into that. So I sort of went that route a little bit. And I realized that people genuinely use social media. I know the movie Chef, they totally like glorify it, but in, it truly, you guys know, but it, it works to no end. So I took advantage of that. And I was confident. I know it sounds a little bit cocky, I was so confident in the product that I knew if I could get you to try it, you come back, but it was just getting people to know about us and to come to the truck for the first time. That was the challenge. But to get my footing, maybe, actually this is weird. We had a viral news story with Bill Murray three months into business. And then from that moment on, I mean, we were in, it was a national news story. So from that moment on, people knew who we were and we won best food truck LA from LA Weekly. So I was about three to four months which is unheard of to my friends that are in the business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you had you had some amazing early customers and, and early you know backers yeah. of the truck. Yeah, absolutely. We were living in Sherman Oaks at the time and a location scout came to my house asking if they could film at our house. And my wife and I, I'd worked in the business. I was like, no, I've seen them literally destroy hardwood floors, drilling into C stands and like, we're not doing it. So. I come home from work and she goes, oh, this location scout came by to film. They went, and you know, I said no. And I was like, what was it for? And she's like, some Bill Murray movie. And he's like my idol. I'm like, wait, what? What'd you say? She's like, I said no. I'm like, you said no to Bill Murray? Are you out of your mind? So long story short, I'm like, this guy's my idol. I have an ice cream truck. My neighbor said yes to the location scout. I'm going to throw an ice cream party for Bill Murray. So I called it the Bill Murray ice cream social. And I parked outside the set. And I gave everyone free ice cream, hoping he would actually show up. He shows up. He comes on the truck. We take photos. I'm like, this is awesome. I post it to my Instagram. The next day, my friend Chris calls me. He's like, Joe, you know, Bill Murray's stories are huge on Reddit. I had no clue what Reddit was. He posts it. You're never going to believe it came to my friend's ice cream truck. He called me. Chris is like a soft-spoken guy. He calls me like a stockbroker screaming. He's like, Joe, you are the number one post on Reddit. And I was like, what, what, is, what does that mean? He's like, this is the most searched image on the internet right now. I was like, get out of here. And then instantly, Rolling Stone, Today Show, Vanity Fair. I got emails. From, I'm like, what is happening? And everyone wanted to hear the story. Like, tell us about Bill Murray because he does all these crazy things. We want to hear what happened. And I told the story. And I just asked them that they use CBT Softs of Los Angeles in their articles. And, I mean, it was nuts. We were headlines right after that. So Bill Murray, a joke, no joke, Bill Murray helped my business take off, 100%. Incredible story. <laughs> okay. Incredible. And I'm yeah. just thinking, you know, of that moment, I mean, some people will never get Bill Murray to come on their ice cream truck or their, their sure. store or whatever, but you set yourself up for it. Like not, those those people uh, who, who won't have Bill Murray grace their business, they might also be the people who can't see the opportunity that you did where your neighbor had said yes to the filming location. Yeah. And so you were like, well, if we can't be the, the location that Bill Murray's going to film at, I'm going to be the next best thing. And I'm going to yeah. park my truck right outside. And it's, it's like catching flies with honey. Sure. And not only that, a couple things, he didn't have to show up. He could have been like, who's this crazy weirdo with an ice cream truck? I'm not going to do it. Like there, there's a lot of things that just happened to work out that night. It was insane. And then even for like 
I now know how Reddit works. It didn't have to get <laughs> voted up. It just got voted up. They just clicked on it. This is cool. Oh, this is cool. And it, that could have totally just died out. I'm sure there's crazy stories on Reddit that no one ever sees because people just don't vote it. There was a lot of luck with it, for sure. The GameStop of ice cream. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is it. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, you know, again, if you could give like entrepreneurs advice around your journey and, you know, I think a lot of it, like whenever I talk to my friends and whatever they ask, like interesting questions, I'll just say, you know, I'm a tropical flower. I say that like I'm a tropical flower and I just happen to bloom in places kind of like LA, right? Like yep. I'm, a, I'm a warm weather guy, the energy of people chasing their dreams, whatever their dreams may be, whether it's entrepreneurship or acting or music or just expression of self. I think LA, you know, no matter what people say about it, it's still cheap enough to figure it out and interesting enough for people to make it. And that energy is something that, you know, my tropical flowerness really needs to to go. And in that I can meet people like you and together, you know, the expression sort of just takes on a momentum where all of a sudden it leads to bigger opportunities or bigger things. When people ask you even like, what do you, what, what, what would you say? Like your, your tips for entrepreneurship might be like, what do you, what do you tell them at least in, in relation to your story? In relation to my story, like we can joke all we want, or I can make funny jokes on Instagram. But at the end of the day, if my ice cream sucks, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So I tell everyone, no, what, if it's ice cream, if it's photography, just do double, triple down on it. Be so good at what you do and focus on that one thing that people can't deny it. Steve Martin has a quote. We have a, a quote of it on our truck. It says, be so good, they can't ignore you. Mm -hmm. And I, I tell people that all the time, no matter your podcast, anything, just focus, go all in on that one thing and focus on that. And people will, I mean, I know it sounds cheesy. If you build it, they will come. Maybe they won't come. But <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I genuinely believe if you focus on that thing, that's what I tell people all the time. Don't worry about your Instagram follower count. Don't worry about any of that crap. Like just focus on being the best wedding DJ you can be because then people are gonna be like, oh, this wedding DJ was awesome. You have to hire. Him. And yeah. then yes, the social media and the press will follow. I think that's so true. I can, I can speak to some of it. At least I was in tech formerly and in tech, there's this weird thing where, you know, everyone for the most part is in their early twenties, mid twenties, and we're just so focused on giving the world an appearance that we're bigger than what we are. Like we're so sure. focused on, and, and the term for this is called growth hacking, right? It's like this yep. cool term that we've developed and it's like, oh, who's the, who's the latest growth hacker and what's your hack and blah, blah, blah. And the problem with it is I just feel like it's like, we're not talking about what we do. We're just talking about the people that we know at Forbes that can write articles about our funding. And yep. There's a huge disconnect between this. And I, I, you know, I personally, I think if I was like 28 when I realized this and I was like, oh, we've, to your point, we've been chasing the wrong thing. Like we should just be making our product so exceptional, but instead we're spending a lot of our energy, which is finite and a lot of our time, which is finite on things that are like almost like peacocking. Like we just want to be like the pretty girl in the room. And that, and that's, I get that, but it's really short-sighted. And, uh, you know, at least I learned that when I was in tech. Yeah, that's that's the whole influencer culture in general and like trying to do this thing and like, okay, but then what do you do? Like, what is that? You have a, a high follow count, which we now know you can buy, which is all, it's all bullshit. But I was getting frustrated early on. We were just, we were doing this fake fame. There's a thing on HBO Max called Fake Fame, a documentary, and we're doing a fake fame uh, special the truck as a joke. But I was just on, K-Rock had us on for an interview and I told him this story early on, I had a line at this Burbank event down the street. We were slammed. It was probably like six months in. This kid loved my ice cream. He's like 20 years old. And he said, this is so good. I can't believe you only have 5,000 followers. And I was like, I have a line down the street. Well, you like my ice cream? What, what does it matter? Why, why are we focusing on that? And my neighboring truck at the food truck event had close to 50,000 followers and he had no line. Mm. And I'm like, it's all smoke and mirrors. Like at the end of the day, if the product is good, that's it. Focus on the product, whether it's food or a service, you name it. That just focus on that. This is so true. This this reminds me of so there's a place called Bootleg Pizza. They have a food truck also. And they got like a snub, like they weren't in the top ten pizza food trucks. And uh, Nick actually I, I had this pizza with Nick and I think it's like the best ever. Like literally. And so I literally wrote into the eater like the writer of Eater, and I know a few of them, and I was like, I cannot believe that you didn't mention bootleg pizza and uh -huh. it's it's and you know to your point i'm just a fan of the product 
and I'm a nobody, right? Like, it's like, I'm just a fan writing into an editor because that's the product is that good. And I felt yeah. I took it personally that they weren't mentioned. And going back to, to that, like smoke and mirror culture, I don't think there's anything better. And I tell people this other entrepreneurs all the time. There's nothing better to me than word of mouth advertising. And I don't believe you guys can roll your eyes at me all you want. If Kim Kardashian comes to my truck and takes a photo and it goes crazy, people are going to hit the like button, but I don't know that, that all those people are going to come to my truck. I genuinely believe that if your friend tells you, you've got to try this ice cream, you're more likely to go and try it. But And that's not for ice cream, for anything. I think word of mouth, personally word of mouth, not Instagram word of mouth is the top. I mean, I'm kind of contradicting myself with the whole Bill Murray story because that brought people to the truck. But at the end of the day, <laughs> but I genuinely believe word of mouth advertising, there's nothing better. Well, I think there's a, a fine line to this and, and a nuance as well, because it's not as if everyone who's a fan of Bill Murray saw that went to your truck and bought some ice cream but Correct. people who are a fan of bill murray now knew about your truck and i'd like to think that some of them went to your truck went and got some ice cream loved it and then told their, told friends. their friends so it was Absolutely. a catalyst and yeah. there's a there's a clear difference between say a, an instagram influencer with with no real passionate fan base versus a bill murray who's an american icon and sure. I think that's that's kind of where I you know you said you were contradicting yourself. I I think it's it's selling yourself short. I think you you understand the line between someone who can genuinely like you're a fan of and whose support can genuinely help your business. Like Courtney Cox tweeting out uh, sure. support of of CVT on your very first day versus someone who just at just wants free ice cream and that just wants to feel important. Mm. That and and that difference is hugely, <laughs> hugely important yeah. and, and a Grand Canyon apart from each other. Joe, how much is an ice cream? How much is your soft serve? What do you sell it for? Four the dollars. twist. Four, Four American dollars. dollars. Wow. Four dollars. And they want it for free? Yeah. Not only do they want it for free. Because they're the a most... healthcare hero? They're like a hero? <laughs> no, the most common requests we get for freebies are influencers or people like we were doing a party and there's going to be these influencers there and they're going to take photos at your truck or I get, I'm not going to name names. I'm sorry guys, but I have actors and actresses who their people say, Hey, such and such is willing to take some photos of the truck in exchange for your services. And I'm like, you are out of your mind. I said, I joke, I'm like my kids school, they, the tuition payment, they don't take celebrity photos. They actually take money. So I, <laughs> I need, I need currency to pay for my kids so they can go to school. But you would be shocked at some of the very successful people in Hollywood. Maybe you wouldn't be shocked, but they've asked for freebies. And it's because they're promising exposure. And I'm like, you are out of your mind. And we have this other viral story where I took on influencers just as a joke. It went like global. And I got more exposure for mocking the very people that were promising me exposure. It was it was absurd. Can we so, can we talk about that a little bit? So you had a yeah, sign that says influencers yeah. paid double? Perfect. I had a, a party request for 300 people. I mean, I've been getting freebie requests forever and I just tell them to get the hell out of here. But I had one for 300 people to like this TikTok type house to come out and do this party for free and they'll get all this exposure. And I was like, I am so over this. I made a sign as a joke that said influencers pay double. And I put it in my window as a joke. I took a selfie with it saying we have a new policy now. This guy, his name's Rick. He's in Burbank. He's a follower of ours. He did exactly what my friend Chris did with Bill Murray. He posted it to Reddit. It went globally viral. We were on in the the BBC. I was in Time Magazine. I was on the Today Show in Australia for this little <laughs> sign. I clearly struck a nerve with small business owners around the world saying, this is so absolutely ridiculous. And Influencers Pay Double went viral. It was like a trending hashtag. And I thought, this happened uh, 2019 in July. It was like 4th of July weekend when it happened. I was like, well, it's just going to go away. And it just kept going. And it, it was in a news cycle for about two weeks. And then anytime influencers are mentioned or any anti-influencer backlash, we get mentioned. So it's now going on two years of people like, oh, that's the truck thing. But again, not my intention. I did it as a joke, as kind of a screw you. I don't want to deal with your crap. And it, I love it. it worked out. On a bit of a like, kind of a serious note that we we tell or I tell like a, on a lot of our projects we we might have an investor group and 
typically if there's an investor in a project, they'll think like, oh, I'm going to get free beer or free coffee or free blah, mm -hmm. blah. And so I always tell the investors, I'm like, you are investing in the livelihood of them. Mm -hmm. If you want free beer, you are killing them. So yes. your job is this. And I, and I usually tell the businesses offline, I'm like, you're going to charge them double because they <laughs> are literally tied, like literally tied to your success. Absolutely. And, and it, you have to change the mindset. You really do. Because this notion of like, oh, investors should just get a, you know, a steal because they wrote a big check is really dumb. It's like you're, you're thinking about this totally illogically, you know, and yeah. Get, or give it some time, even with a startup, like get, give it some time. I comp my friends or tried to, and I started and all my, most of, not all, but most of my friends were just like, you were out of your mind. They were paying me double anyway. They want me yeah. to succeed. Yeah. Um, I, I read something, I don't know where I saw it, that they said people should throw business showers like they throw baby showers. Like Elon Musk, yeah. Yeah, let's just give these people all the support possible to let them grow. Then when they're seven years in, then you can give them some free ice cream because they use support them. You, you help them grow. There is a downside to that. When all your friends start businesses, they're like, hey, Dig, remember that time you said you guys told me a business shower? <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, how much is your product? They're like, oh, it's 200 bucks. I'm like, oh, 200 bucks or seven of you? Okay. All right, guys, this is a nice day. <laughs> relax, okay. relax. I'll eat, I'll eat my dog food. I'll, I'll, I'm, yeah. in. I'm a fan. I'm a fan. I just love the honesty of that. And I think that's what people connect with, you know, of everything that you're saying and everything that you're doing. And that's really important that you're not afraid to, to share your personality uh, within yep. your product. I think that's pretty yep. badass. Thank you. I saw another, it was like a TED talk or something. I think it was uh, Mark Cuban. I don't know. Whatever. I think it was Mark Cuban. He said, if everyone's doing this, and he put his hand up in the air, he goes, do this. And he put his other hand down to the ground. Like, so when I think of like Instagram and businesses, I just think of these beautifully lit photos of product, like just total stage people laughing while they're holding their green juice. I'm like, this is so stupid. Like, so yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna take the most realistic photos possible and like just talk about real things. And I think it was a breath of fresh air for people. I had a call recently with a founder, and I was like, "Why did you start your company?" And she said, Be "So she started a uh, a skincare not skincare sunscreen company, uh -huh. and she herself had gotten skin cancer on her face oh. because of because of like the sun exposure." And in her trying to figure this out, she realized like SPF 30 and SPF 50 has like the same ingredients. And she's like, literally sure. Diego, go to like the next, next time you see SPF 30, 50, flip them over. You'll see no, there's no difference actually in ingredients. And I was like, that's shocking and interesting. So then yep. I went to her, I went to her Instagram and I was like, this story is deeply personal to you. Like you're, you're not, you're solving your problem. It just happens to be sunscreen and, and you know, sun, sun protection. And I go to her Instagram and it's all like beautiful photos. That's all it is. And I'm like, where is your story in this? Like, where is you in all of this? You know, and I think mm -hmm. I know a lot of entrepreneurs are a little nervous because they don't want to like they don't want to push people or they don't want to seem, a, I don't know, like so in your face about stuff. But I think you have to. I think you got to commit. I dealt with that a lot in November with the election. And I was very vocal about mm. how I felt about our now president, who is a diehard ice cream lover. If you've ever Googled Joe Biden, <laughs> yes, ice, yeah. I was like, we have the same name. <laughs> he loves <laughs> ice cream. A lot of people, is, LA is a very liberal town. I'm just going to go for it. And the Harvard Business Review wrote a whole thing about how, you know, you should lean into your politics. And it used to be a faux pas. Like, you know, you don't talk about your politics in your business. You don't mix the two. And I, we made an orange crush float based on Donald Trump losing. Like that was his, he's the orange man. We made this orange thing and people loved it. And even people that were like, were Trumpers were like, this is funny. I'm going to come out anyway, because this guy's got a good sense of humor about it. So and I know, especially for a new business, like a newbie, like, oh, I can't talk about Joe Biden, and Donald Trump. We're just starting. I don't want to alienate half my business, but I don't experience that. Yeah, no, yeah, I love that. Even as a podcast, you know, it's like tough. Sometimes we'll have people on and, you know, they'll start leaning one way or another. And for us, it's like, like I'm happy to give my opinion for sure. And I don't mind the judgment at all. But sometimes you're you're very cognizant of it, no matter what. You're very cognizant sure. of. Yep. Right. I don't know if I just say this, say that. In that same yeah. article, they went to George Washington University and they're in the food court. And these are all very liberal people that go to George Washington University. And they had three places. Two of them had no line, and the third one had a line around the corner, and it's Chick-fil-A. I was like, this company used to pr be anti, I mean, they're very religious company. Mm -hmm. They donated money that was like anti-gay marriage, like, and 
these are liberal people like so what we're we're just gonna so here's chick-fil-a saying you know what we are proudly donating to this we're closed on sundays because we believe in this and people still show up because their chicken's ridiculously good so yeah. they focus on the product and then they're like we're gonna talk about whatever we want to talk about that's a great example so, for people because you're so right. It's like so obliviously religious. I think they were not even given birth control to their employees as a benefit. Like they specifically cited religious reasons to, to do that. I'm convinced Chick-fil-A is like the best private equity play ever. I just think it's like, hey guys, we're opening Sunday. Like they just start hurting and they're like, new rule, we're open Sundays. And open then the, the business yep. just booms. It's like a, another yep. billion. In-N-Out Burger has a Bible verse on every piece of their packaging. They also... If you Google it, donated to Trump's reelection campaign. I've never seen an In-N-Out Burger in Los Angeles without a huge line at their drive-thru. And LA is a very liberal city. People will turn a blind eye to the fact that they're super religious because they love the burgers. Yeah. My pillow guy though didn't focus on his oh, no, product did enough. Not work out for him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, I'm contradicting myself again. <laughs> oh, uh, again, so I think funny. there's it comes down to there being a fine line between just having your beliefs and then going too far. Yep. And I do say, I said this to a customer the other day and I said it to you guys earlier and it sounds, I'm glad we're doing this on videos. So they see I'm not like this arrogant asshole, <laughs> but I, like if they might I still think believe, that show, by the way, they might they, still, well, okay, fine, but at least they can, they're not, they're, they're not reading it in an article. They can see my face. Right. Um, if I, if, if I thought my ice cream was subpar or what just sucked, I would never talk the way I talk on Instagram. I'm so confident in how good our product is that I'm like, fine, go get soft serve somewhere else and then we'll talk. I know people that are Trumpers that hate my Instagram and they still buy my ice cream. There's a writer, I forget his name. His name is Oren something, but he talks about this where, you know, he talks about, he's just like, know your worth and just commit to your product, right? And just get really good at it. And then people are like, so what's the tactic you took to raise your prices? And he's like, it's not a tactic. It's not a tactic in any capacity. It's just yes. me knowing I'm the best photographer or whatever it is. Like he's like the best negotiator, the best deal closer, the best ice cream maker, whatever it is, knowing your value and demanding that the market knows it too. That's it. It's not a tactic. I'm demanding $4. I'm demanding it. <laughs> Do you raise prices every year, like a quarter? Like, how do you, do, do people give you nickels? Do they give you dimes? How, what does it no, come with? You accept credit cards. We were lower when we started and my dairy raises prices, believe it or not. My, the gas that goes in our truck goes up. Inflation is a real thing. So I just right. tell people like, if I can keep this affordable, I'm going to keep it affordable. But like at some point I do have to go up a little bit. And we have since we opened. Do you give your kids an allowance that's $4 a week? I should. <laughs> no, it's funny. Our, our, our oldest son, he's not almost 10 years old. He really wants to work for the business. And I'm like, you're nine. No. So we gave him a job. He now does inventory for the business. So like every Thursday before I place my orders for sprinkles or cones or whatever, he now has, he has a whole like binder. He takes it very seriously. And he does, he, he gets paid now on, on under the table. I don't know if I should get the IRS listening to your podcast. But... Sorry, we'll bleep that out. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. He gets paid in sprinkles. <laughs> yes. But I told him, I was actually going to do this in the next couple of days. I'm like, this is a very serious job. We're going to post a picture of you doing your inventory on Instagram. And I'm going to let everyone know if they show up to the truck and there aren't sprinkles or spoons, it's your fault. So just, <laughs> this is a lot of pressure on your shoulders. Wow. So he's like, I, I can handle it. I can handle it. That's awesome. I love it. Teaching him accountability at a <laughs> yes. very young age. <laughs> Absolutely. One of the things that's like super hot right now in the city of West Hollywood anyway, is the city of West Hollywood, for whatever reason, has decided to preemptively raise the minimum wage to $18 an hour, which is the highest in the country. And it's not LA, it's the little four mile, four square mile area of West Hollywood. And Obviously, West Hollywood has like the Sunset Strip, and so there's a tremendous number of hotels and restaurants that are all fighting this presently. And the thought process is that the union is going to be like, yeah, you're right. Maybe 18 is too high. Let's agree to 16, which would still be the highest in the country. The consumer is just going to be like, these prices, I got to buy $30 for a cheeseburger. Like, you know what I mean? Like the, right. the inflation, it's just going to trickle down to the consumer and they're going to think it's ridiculous. But like, I'm all for a living wage. I don't know why they're addressing this during the worst possible time for the hospitality industry. 
I don't it's get very it. strange. Yeah. And all the business yes. owners are saying like, Hey, by the way, I've made less money than all of my employees who I've kept on, st on staff th during this yep. entire pandemic. And like, no one's trying to help me and I'm not yep. the best. You know, I, I think there's this weird thing in, in today's world where it's the, the society hates the CEO, but the CEO looks like you or can, and the CEO can look like the guy at Best Buy. And these are way two different CEOs. You know what I mean? Like, and yeah. I think it's just important that we start realizing for an area to be as vibrant as West Hollywood or even Sherman Oaks, you have a lot of mom and pop shops. You have just a lot of people putting their, their soul into their businesses. And they're not, they're not the CEOs of Chick-fil-A, you know, and we need to treat them differently. And I, it's just, it's so crazy what's happening right now. There's a stigma for business owners of being that, oh, they're being greedy, that they don't want to, they don't want to deal right. with the 15, 16 dollar minimum. Like, it's not that. We're going to have to raise our prices so much. And then you're going to complain and say, that's ridiculous. I'm not going to pay that much for ice cream. I'm not going to pay that much for this thing. Like, well, how am I supposed to pay my staff? Gas prices went up. My dairy, my ice cream, everything else is going up. I have to, I have a family to support too. So it's going to be an interesting thing. I don't know how gradually they're going to go up in, in wage, but it's just a horrible, I mean, the restaurant business is hemorrhaging. It's like the worst possible yeah. time ever to do something like this. I'm very pro small business on our, our social media too. I'm like, I tell people like, if you don't support these people now, they right. will not be able to afford to come back. And then like, we're gonna have Taco Bell as the main choice for food because they're right. gonna make it, they'll be, they'll be fine. That's a whole that's exactly, story, I don't that's know. A, no, But that's what's happening. So I think that that's when, whenever I talk to these people, I always just say, look, you're just making America corporate really because the only people that have the balance sheet to sustain a pandemic and to keep moving forward without PPP loans are effectively the corporations that are massive. And so you're just gonna have a block full of every single big name. Like you might as well just put Coca-Cola on the street at this point because no one yep. else is gonna be able to survive. And no. it's like, they get it, but they think I'm exaggerating the issue. I'm like, y'all don't understand math. Like this is not yeah. difficult. They're being uh, super dramatic. They think I'm being dramatic. I'm like, I know a lot of people that work remotely and they, this pandemic has not affected them at all. They still get their paycheck every two weeks. Like, isn't right. They're doing all their work in their sweatpants at their house. But like there are people like myself or in the in hospitality industry, they have to go to work and they have to be out there. And it's a crazy time. If you don't have the support, they're, they're, people aren't going to bounce back from this. I don't want right. to sound like too depressing, but it's true. So No, it is true. I mean, and pre-pandemic, you know, we looked at in real estate development, we work closely with our tenants. And I was looking at the, the numbers on the restaurant industry and I was like, oh, wow, the minimum wage has been killing restaurants for years, years. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, restaurants who are in certain communities, let's say they have to keep their prices low to get the, the foot traffic. And so yeah. it puts these restaurants in a bind and it and it most of them don't make it because it just yeah. it doesn't work. You have to hire. And then it's just not it's not even a restaurant staff, which is full of turnover. Right. It's like you have that. You have your training, you got your valet staff. If you have that kind of restaurant. Yeah, it's just a. Uh, it's, a lot. it's just a mess. Let's talk about your future. What do you you know, you're coming out of the pandemic. Sounds like everything's good. Everything feels I feel the fuzzies in talking to you. You know, what are some growth plans for you? More trucks? What, what do you uh, think? So we, a couple of years ago, we, we launched this thing called CVTini, where we're branding soft serve ice cream machines to look like our trucks. We come and we vinyl wrap them to look like the trucks. And Whoa. we start wholesaling, yeah, we start wholesaling our mix. And Whoa. I wanted to find specific restaurants and bars that we felt like were in alignment with our product. And we started doing that, but of course, with the pandemic, I mean, we have a we have a machine on the Queen Mary, the ship, but that had to shut down because of COVID. Um, we have one at Alfred Coffee, but a lot of these places they dialed back their menus because of it. But the goal for us, because I, yes, we have more trucks, but they're very limited in how far they can go based on the limitations mechanically. Um, the goal for us is to kind of make it turn it into a bit of a wholesale business where people can have CVT anywhere. It's our proprietary mix. We just need you to have a soft serve machine and give us a little branding. How big is the soft serve machine? Like, what are the dimensions it's of this? Depends. There's a, so there's this really great burger place in Silver Lake called Burgers Never Say Die. They have one on a countertop. Um, okay. Just, oh, okay. Yeah, they have a countertop version and then they have a standalone version that you'd see like um, a McDonald's or whatever. And it, it plugs in. How long does the uh, mix last? Like, or how often? Yeah, like how fast do you have to go through the mix? Uh, the shelf life is two weeks refrigerated, but it, it ships okay. frozen and it's a year. So you can keep it in your freezer for a year, but once you pull it out to thought, you have two weeks to sell it. There's very little waste. Nice. Um, it's just finding the right people and th them wanting a machine and 
it's been a bit of a challenge, but I feel like it's kind of a follow the leader type business model. We'll see. I, I, the goal for me will be to get on a chain. Like, uh, yeah. I know if we're, we've been talking with a few people. I don't want to jinx it, but like they're thinking about putting it in their menu and they have like 70 stores. So Equinox gyms, obviously. There you go. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> My dad has had this idea forever. He thinks that, you know, you're coming out of a workout, you're feeling great yeah. and you want to reward yourself. So ice cream is the natural reward that you, you think of. I have to tell you, Nick, one of my best spots on the streets is Mendocino Farms. I told you about Pink's Hot Dogs earlier. People go in there and they have a salad or a sandwich and they're feeling good. I'm like, oh, I'm going to treat myself because I just ate a healthy lunch. Yeah. And it's, it's our best spot. We're there like four days a week. The, the mental gymnastics it's a real market. there. It's a, it's <laughs> yeah. a real market. I, I've seen this live like when, where someone like walked a couple blocks with me and they're like, I'm going to treat myself. I uh, feel good. And I'm going to mm -hmm. order the fries. And I'm like, wow, that's a yeah. net negative. How, okay. I kind of selfishly, I would love one of these things in our podcast studio. I think that'd be epic. Uh, yeah. Uh, we can talk about that later. That's amazing. Sure. We got close with AEG. We're talking to them about putting them at either StubHub Center or Staples Center for a while, but they call that a partner. Uh, they had a very clever way of saying it, but basically you you pay for the, them to have your product there. It's basically all ever. <laughs> so but Budweiser, when they sell Budweiser at Dodger Stadium, it's a uh, sponsorship partnership. That's what they call it. So it. you had to pay an absurd fee to them to then let them sell your product and then they keep all the profit. So that's why, and it's kind of a frustrating thing. They say they want local at these stadiums. I'm like, if you want local, there should be an In-N-Out burger and a Pink's hot dog in the Staples Center, but there's not. And there's reason that, that it's McDonald's is because they want you to pay to then have the privilege to let them sell your product. I, I can almost understand it up to a certain point. Like I can understand if you, if you if you had to pay to get into the space, but then to not be able to keep your profit is absurd. Yeah, it's it's basically a billboard. I know people are like, oh my God, that's crazy. I'm like, yeah, if you are paying for them to sell your product and the, the prices are ridiculous, you know? Right. For retail, retail price for a beer at a, at a Dodger game, it's yeah. crazy. Nine bucks. So wait, yep. how does the machine work? So does the machine take money? Or like, how does it know? Or is there someone operating it? Oh, there's someone operating it. Yeah, it's like a software okay. machine. Yeah, so we okay. have them at um, Profeta, which is a coffee shop in Westwood. Uh, we have one at this brewery. This One of our best CVP customers is a McLeod Brewery in I'm, Van Nuys. I'm glad you brought this up. I saw this on your Instagram and yeah, got they very do excited. Stout. They do Guinness and Stout floats and they sell a lot of them. But also McLeod Ooh. is a, yeah, McLeod is a, tasting room so they're all ages so they have families that go in there and like oh well dad's gonna have a beer i'll get an ice cream for the kids so, so diego and i are big fans of mcleods because oh. i i actually live only a couple blocks away from mcleods so oh, okay i go there quite often and when i saw that you had uh put a, a cvt C mini in the yep. in mcleods i'm i made a mental note that i'm going there this week yeah. to, awesome. to try yeah. it out no that, we love that place that's great. That's a really good idea. So we're building a brewery. So this is another one of these. This would be ideal because the whole brewery we're building right now, pre-COVID, the concept was make all the space outside because there's no like place. There's no brewery in LA that you can like drink outside, which is shocking. And so yep. that literally most of the brewery we're building is outside. And so this would be perfect for the, the kids or just the adults like me. Well, listen, it's getting late. I know you got to go back to the kids, but uh, just tell everyone where they can find you and all that good stuff. Yeah, our website is cbtsoftserve.com and we're on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at cbtsoftserve. And if you want to physically find one of our trucks, our first post of every day has our times and locations. I love it. Thanks right so much on. for coming on the podcast, Joe. Yeah, I really appreciate this, Joe. Thank you, guys.